Welcome back to chapter four, where we are discussing functional modeling from the point of view of the end user. The first step in the process of functional modeling was to identify the functionality, the major functionality, from the point of view of the user. And using that information, we created a use case diagram, which identifies all of the use cases and the actors who are involved in or in relationship with those use cases. The next step in the process is to take a single use case, a single functionality, and to begin to identify the steps that make up that single functionality and use that to create an activity diagram. Since a use case is a very high level functionality of the system, it can be very, very helpful to go into detail on a single functionality and to identify the processes or the steps that are involved in that functionality. So as we go about identifying the steps in a process or a functionality, there's a couple of things that we can keep in mind. First of all, we need to be realistic because it would be impossible for us to know every single detail, every single tiny step that's involved in a process. Remember, we're going for detail, not minutia. And another one is to be agile. We want to be rigorous in the things that we do identify the software engineering, as a general rule, is a collaborative process. And so talking with other people and bouncing ideas off of other people can be very helpful as you're trying to identify the steps in a process. And the refinement process in software development means the first time that I go through it means I may not have a complete picture, but every time I add more detail, I get a better and better picture. I also want to stay focused on the current process. It's really easy to get distracted by other things and to go off into left field. So to the best of my ability, I want to stay focused. And remember, we are talking about detail, not minutia. So don't get too bogged down in a ton of steps that would stop us from actually completing the work. We're going to take a single use case and we're going to break it down into its associated actions and activities. Um, let's think of the use case diagram that we had before about ordering at the restaurant. We have a variety of different use cases to choose from. We're going to pick one that has a level of detail that we would like to delve into more and get a better understanding of the steps involved in the process. So we're going to look at ordering food. So how about if we start off this process by just brainstorming some of the steps that might potentially be a part of placing an order. Um, it seems like the very first thing that we would need to do is to browse the menu. Then we need to decide what we want. And a part of deciding what we want is picking an appetizer. Let's say, for instance, we want a blooming onion. Remember we said in the last video that the appetizer comes with the dinner. So the next thing that we need to decide is what am I hungry for for a main course? Maybe we're interested in a steak. Maybe we'd rather have some shrimp or maybe we'd like something healthy, a cob salad. After we've decided on our main course, now we're gonna have to decide on the sides that go along with it. Um, if we're hungry for shrimp, maybe we decide that we would like some soup and salad. If we said that we wanted steak, maybe we're gonna have a baked potato and some salad. And if we're being healthy with a cob salad, maybe we'll choose a side dish of a fruit salad. So the next step in the process was it would be to decide what you'd like to drink. Uh, maybe you want to drink water. Maybe with that we'll have some soda as well. You'd like to have the wine that we showed or maybe you'd like to have a virgin strawberry banana daiquiri. And then the last step in the process would be to pick the dessert. Your party decides that they might like to have a chocolate volcano. So the last thing that we're gonna do, the last part of ordering the food, is to actually tell the waiter our preferences. Now that we have brainstormed the steps, the next thing that we're gonna do is actually create an activity diagram. Now these diagrams look remarkably like flow charts. They use all of the same symbols of the pro flow charts. But as with any UML diagram, the symbols that we use mean something. So let's look at the components that make up an activity diagram. So the first component in an activity diagram would be an activity. Actions and activities are just some sort of specific behavior or action that is taken. They do have verb noun phrases, just like the use case diagrams, because they are displaying action. So we would want to order a main course or order a dessert instead of just dessert. Dessert is a noun, but ordering a dessert is a verb noun phrase. 
The next component in an activity diagram are nodes. There are a variety of different nodes. A decision node acts remarkably like an if statement would in a programming language. If A do this, else do that. And if we have a decision node that is going to break the flow, then we're gonna to have to have a merge node that will bring the flow back together because another one of the nodes that we're gonna see is an initial node and a final node. All of the action and the activities in an activity diagram start at a single point in place with an initial node, and all of the flow will drive down to a single final node. And so if we break the path or break the flow using an if statement, we have to bring it back together with a merge node. Those are both represented here on the fifth and the fourth row from the very bottom of this diagram. Now another type of a node that can break the flow is called a fork node. And this is when we can have activities that can occur in parallel at the same time. And if we are going to fork the node or break the flow with a fork, we're gonna to have to join, bring it back together, bring the flow back together with a join node. Those are the third and the second row from the very bottom of the diagram. Now the last one is a swim lane. A swim lane, sometimes we wanna indicate which user is responsible for which one of these activities. For the most part, this activity diagram are user or object independent. It doesn't matter who is performing what activity, but sometimes for the sake of clarity, we might wanna actually decide to indicate on the activity diagram who is responsible for these particular actions. And then of course, the last component in an activity diagram are the flow themselves. They are just the lines with the arrows indicating the direction that the flow is occurring. So let, using these components, let's create an activity diagram, modeling, ordering, placing an order. And we're gonna use Lucid Charts again to do that. In the homework assignment for chapter four, there is a link to some tools that we can use to create these UML diagrams. There are a variety of different tools that are available to us. Lucid Chart is one of them, and it's the diagramming tool that we used to create our use case diagram. So we're gonna use it again to create our activity diagram. You can sign in with Google and use your Weber email credentials in order to get in. This is the home page. Um, I'm going to use the document creator the drop down arrow and this time I'm just going to select a blank diagram. Down here are some examples of some UML activity diagrams. Here is an example of an activity diagram. I can see the start node at the beginning. I can see the activities and the actions in the rounded rectangles. I can see a decision node where they are branching the flow and I see the merge node where they're bringing the flow back together and then I see the final end node at the bottom. I also see some forks and a join for activities that are being completed in parallel. And the interesting thing is that they are using color on this particular diagram to indicate who is responsible for each one of the activities. They also have a diagram specifically for swim lanes. And you'll notice in this example that there are swim lanes across the top for a customer, a clerk, and a system and then if I move down the individual lanes, I can see the individuals who are responsible for that activity. So if I click on UML diagrams and then I select a blank diagram, it brings me up to a sheet where I can build our activity diagrams. And then if I scroll down the navigation on the left-hand side, I'm gonna come across the UML state slash activity shapes. And these are the shapes that I'm going to need in order to create an activity diagram. It would seem that the first thing that I'm going to drop onto my screen are the activities themselves. There is a shape that is called an activity, but it includes a symbol inside of it. If I choose a state, I can drag a straight state onto the screen and it's going to give me the same effect. If I click inside of it, it is going to allow me to give them the name of the state. If we come back to the list of potential activities or steps within the process, I can see that the first thing that we wanted to do is to browse a menu and then we're going to decide what we want from there. So this first date or this first activity, I'm going to say on browse menu. Remember, 
that the activities and the actions have to have a verb noun phrase to indicate that it is an action. I'm going to make the screen full size so that I can see the entire page. Now if I come back to the ideas that we had for steps, the next one was to decide what we want. The first thing that we're going to do is to pick an appetizer. So I'm going to add pick an appetizer as the next step on the diagram. So I'll drop it onto the screen. I'll change the name inside of it. <clears throat> and then this says, what are we hungry for? This to me looks like a decision that has to be made. Are we hungry for shrimp, steak, or salad? This is an indication that a possible um, decision diamond that might be necessary. So I'm going to add three more activities to my diagram for the three different decisions that we can make. Now remember the names need to be verb noun phrases so I can't just put the word steak, shrimp, and cob salad in here. I have to indicate some kind of an action that's taking place. And since a decision has to be made, I'm going to drop a decision diamond onto the screen and normally the if statement would go inside here because we are making some kind of a decision but the way an activity diagram works is instead of putting the question or the decision that has to be made inside of the decision diamond, we're going to put the answer to the questions on the lines that are coming out of the diamond. To draw a line, I am going to click on an object and then I'm going to hover over one of the dots and I'm just going to drag a line to a particular activity. I'm going to repeat the same process with the other two activities. And then I'm going to change the text that is being written on the line to be the answer to the unspoken question. And then to make this even, I'm going to drag the other activities above this so that I have a symmetrical diagram. Now remember I said that if we break the flow using a decision diamond, we have to bring the flow back together using a merge diamond. So I'm going to drag another diamond onto the screen. And this time I'm going to draw the lines from each one of the individual activities back to the merge. And since we're already drawing the lines, I am just going to continue to draw those flow from the very first activity to pick appetizers and then finally into the decision diamond. There is one node that we are missing and that is the start node. And so I'm going to drag the start node to the very top of my diagram and then I will use a arrow to connect the start node to the very first activity. So the next thing that we said we were going to do after we chose our entree was to choose the side dish. Um, normally what would happen is the next thing I would do is to choose the drink that we want. Um, so I'm going to add another activity to choose a drink, but sometimes when I choose a side dish, the server tells me that that side dish is not um, available anymore. Maybe the baked potatoes are gone, and so I have to choose another side dish. So I'm going to use a decision diamond to indicate whether or not I'm going to move on to choosing the drink or whether or not I might have to come back and choose another side dish. So I'm going to have an arrow, an arrowed line coming out of the choose side dish. It's going to go into the decision diamond. From the decision diamond, there's going to be two places that it can go, either to the choose drink or it can come out of the decision diamond and go back to choose side dish again. Now again, I'm going to put the answer to the unspoken question on the text fields on the lines that are coming out of the decision diamond. And then I will drag the choose drink activity down a little bit farther so that I have a clear view of the choice that is being made. This is a way that I can create a loop within an activity diagram indicating the fact that I might have to choose a side dish over and over again if the choice that I make is not available. For this particular instance, this decision diamond is going to become its own merge node because it is creating a loop. So if I go back to the list that we created, I see that we're going to pick a drink and we're going to pick a dessert and then ultimately we're going to tell the waiter what our order is. Um, another kind of um, break in the flow can be a fork where I can do um, activities simultaneously or in parallel. So let's say, for instance, that I could pick a drink and I could pick a dessert both at the same time because for some people, a strawberry banana daiquiri is actually a dessert. So I'm going to add another activity to our activity diagram in order to choose a dessert. 
and then to indicate that these two decisions can be made simultaneously in any order, I'm going to drop a horizontal fork join node onto the screen, and then I'm going to position it above the two of them. I'm actually going to move this arrow that I currently have going from um, the decision diamond down to choose drink. I'm going to move it to the fork node. So I'm going to increase the size of the fork node by grabbing an end and dragging it out to the size that I want it to be. And then I will move the two activities down and I will attach arrows to them. And if we're going to break the flow with a fork node, we have to merge the flow back together again. And so I'm going to repeat the process with another one. I'm going to drag another one out so that I can merge that flow back together and I would connect the lines together. So it looks like we're running out of space at the bottom of our diagram. If I move my cursor over to the right hand side of the screen, I can see this icon that comes out. It is going to allow me to increase the size of the page. So I'm just going to drag it down just a little bit and then I can have a little bit more room. And we said that the last thing that we were going to do was finally tell the waiter our order. So that I need to add one more activity to the diagram. And I need to add a final node or an end node to indicate that the activity is complete. And then I will add the lines that are connecting those two. And I will change this to tell the waiter our order. And once I have done that, we now have a complete activity diagram. I'm going to move it over to center it on the screen. And here is an example of a complete activity diagram. It includes both decision nodes and merge nodes um, for the decisions that have to be made, the if statements. We also have a looping structure in here so that I can repeatedly uh, repeat the same activity over and over again. And then I see we have a fork and a join node that will indicate activities that can be done simultaneously in parallel in no particular order. Um, the one thing that we are missing is a swim lane. Um, most of the time an activity diagram is completely independent of who is doing the activity, um, but sometimes you might want to indicate specific activities, attribute them to specific people or specific actors, and a swim lane is useful for that. Let's say, for instance, that we have one person that is going to be picking the appetizer and the dessert, and we have another person who is going to be choosing the entrees and all the side dishes and the drinks. If I wanted to specifically indicate activities for specific users, I'm going to use a swim lane. So if I choose the shape over here, there is a single swim lane, or you'll notice that Lucid Charts also has a multi-vertical swim lane, and they also have horizontal swim lanes. For our purposes, I am just going to take a single swim lane and I'm going to drop it onto the diagram and then I am going to move the pick appetizers and the choose desserts out just a little bit so I can put them both in a single swim lane. All right, so I've placed a swim lane over pick appetizers and choose dessert. I'm going to place a second swim lane over the other functionality. So I know this is not terribly realistic, but I have two separate swim lanes. If I double click on the name of the swim lane, I can say that this would be maybe customer one, and I'm gonna change this swim lane to indicate maybe customer two. Now you probably noticed that the swim lane is actually cluttering up the diagram a little bit, and that is to be expected, but if it's necessary for me to indicate functionality of a given user or a given object, a swim lane is an excellent way to do that.